Section 2 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies Part 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Golden Opportunity Never was there a better opportunity for earnest agents and sound companies to push their fortunes. By striking while the iron is hot, while the ruins still smoke, a live company may accomplish in the next six months more than it could in ten years under ordinary circumstances. Active agents, energetic officers, solvent companies will now come to the front and carry all before them. The public is alive to the value of insurance policies, which mean indemnity, and will not higgle about rates in the light of the Chicago fire and its crushing testimony against cheap and worthless policies. Now is your chance to enter in and possess the land, gentlemen, officers, and agents. The people are running to meet you more than halfway. They are anxious for once to pay full cost for insurance, if it only be insurance. Let none of you stand back while a few live men rush in and gather a harvest in which you should have a share. Advertise. Circulate your documents. Let your rivalry be only that of getting the best risks at the highest rates, and thus present the insurance companies of the country as a spectacle of bounding elasticity and vitality. Great as have been the losses at Chicago, there is not a company whose assets justify continuance in business, but can turn this seeming disaster into a positive and permanent benefit. The prestige of a company passing through this fiery trial without succumbing will be or should be made equal in moral power to a doubling of its cash capital. See to it that this shall be the result to your own company. A correspondent writing from Hartford discusses as follows the altered condition of fire insurance and fire insurance rates. This disaster will also bring its lesson for good and unpalatable as it may be, nevertheless it will be one not only for the benefit, immediate and direct, of the insurance companies themselves, but also indirectly and eventually of the people at large. It will learn us to put underwriting on a more lasting and enduring foundation, to set aside the petty jealousies and private rivalries which have hitherto existed, much to the detriment of the business, and while there will be, as there must, a general competition, yet it will be based upon system, founded in principle, and tend in no way to lead insurance interests into paths of recklessness and ruin. As a matter of course, this fire will affect the subject of insurance rates, and they will no doubt be advanced. The low-rate system which some of our smaller companies have followed has proved disastrous, and the experiment will not probably be tried again. And this we do not regret. A man is always willing to pay a good price for a good article, and if in future policyholders are charged a larger amount for their insurance, they will not be disposed to grumble at the advance if they know that the concern in which they place their risks is pursuing a course which is not experimental and adventurous, but which, on the contrary, is founded in security and safety, and is dictated by all the reasons which human precaution and foresight can invent to guarantee prosperity and success. One of the newspaper reporters, describing the Great Fire, says, Huge blocks of stone crumbled to dust. The foundations disappeared almost to the bottom stone. The walls were licked up as though of pasteboard, and the huge beams of iron were warped and disappeared like straw. The vaunted fireproof structures offered also as little resistance as the humblest shanty and went in the common ruin. It may be that this statement requires to be accepted with considerable allowance, but the fact remains, proven incontestably for the first time, that a conflagration may rise to that degree of intensity which will seriously endanger the most massive structures that man is capable of building. Just as the eternal rocks are swept away by fierce volcanic eruptions. Yet we should not depreciate the value of the so called fireproof methods of building. A fireproof building is at worst a barrier to the extension of fire, it checks a conflagration by staying the progress of flame, 
and if there be only a sufficient number of these barriers, the duration of the fire cannot be long. Who can doubt for a moment that the northern division of Chicago would have been entirely unharmed, if in that ill-fated business district in the south side there had been a hundred fireproof buildings, instead of merely two or three? The three great conflagrations of modern history have been the great London fire of 1666, burning of Moscow and burning of Chicago. It is remarkable that the magnitude of these conflagrations was not very far from equal in the number of buildings destroyed. The fire in London consumed 13,200 houses. The Moscow conflagration consumed 11,400 houses. The conflagration in Chicago consumed not far from 15,000 houses. The Chicago conflagration was much more extensive than either of its prototypes, in the extent of territory devastated. The burnt district includes nearly four square miles, that of London less than one square mile, that of Moscow considerably more. In the destruction of property also, the Chicago conflagration has taken the first place in history, the loss amounting in round numbers to $150 million. In the rapidity of the conflagration, the Chicago fire is without a parallel. It required sixteen days to burn a square mile of London, and several days and nights to burn a somewhat greater area in Moscow. Twenty hours sufficed to consume four square miles of Chicago, a rate of combustion averaging a square mile every five hours. The pluck exhibited by almost all the companies, with reference to the Great Fire, has been something which falls little short of being sublime. It is not every man who, suddenly cut down from wealth to poverty, will instantly resume active operations and push forward with even greater energy than before. But here are many companies which have lost money by the million, we might almost say, rising out of the ruins, and as eager for the fray as ever. It would be invidious to mention names, even were it worth while, in illustration of the wonderful elasticity and vital force of the companies in this severe ordeal. The country has reason to rejoice that its underwriters are of the unyielding sort, and that both in spirit and in act they stretch out the helping hand toward Chicago, although it may seem like the dividing up of their last crust. The Hartford Courant says that when New York suffered under the Great Fire of 1835, the Hartford, Etna, and Protection Fire Insurance Companies were weak in comparison with the great corporations of these days. At the first word they went to the front, and with the personal credit of their directors backing them, paid promptly every dollar. James G. Bowles was secretary of the Hartford in those days. The stock was only partially paid in. The directors pledged their own means for the remainder, and sent Mr. Bowles to New York to open an agency near the fire. There he settled the claims as fast as possible, and gave out that he was still ready to insure. All the New York insurance companies but one had failed. Before all the claims had matured, Mr. Bowles had received enough in premiums to pay them. Mr. Bowles was a man to do his duty if it bankrupted him. But it made the fortune of the company. It is within bounds to say that in almost every large town in the country, insurance rates are today not more than half what they should be. In all the cities this is absolutely the fact without qualifications. The volume of average loss makes up the main element in the cost of insurance and now that the companies are called upon to pay forty or fifty millions on account of Chicago, it is obvious that the cost of insuring has increased by just the ratio thus added to the loss ratio of former years. If the three and a half million dollars paid to Portland justified doubling the rates in 1866, what shall be said now when rates have again touched bottom and the cost of insurance has actually been quadrupled? The simple test will be to add the cost of the Chicago fire to the average cost of insurance for twenty years past, and then tell us what the rates ought to be. And now, from all parts of the country, comes the gratifying intelligence that a universal advance in fire insurance rates 
has followed the Chicago disaster. The companies which will be able to continue business are none too many, and are none too strong to satisfy the requirements of the business public without this advance in rates. End of section 2